Hey guys, it's Sam Stein here uh, with The Bulwark, and we are fortunate to have on today Evan Ross Smith. He is with the Pulling Project Blueprint. Uh, we brought him on here because, uh, first of all, we like his glass door backdrop, uh, and we wanted to show that off. And secondly is because uh, I, the other day uh, you guys sent out some data that I thought was kind of interesting uh, in that you tested all these biographical facts and political accomplishments and issue positions associated with Kamala Harris to see how the public would react to them. Uh, and we're going to get into the data in a second. But what, the reason I found it was interesting is because the underlying that is this idea that even though she's vice president uh, and has been for over three and a half years, there's a lot that the country doesn't yet know about her. And so we're in this kind of weird period where we have a presidential candidate or a presumptive presidential candidate who hasn't been through primary, is vice president, but may not be all that known to the public. So that is why I had Evan come on to discuss the data. But before we begin any of that, Evan, just tell us a little bit about what you do and a little bit about Blueprint. Sure. Well, I'm, I'm the lead pollster here at Blueprint. I'm very thrilled to be talking with you. Uh, and, and what Blueprint has done over the course of this election is, you know, tried to do some hard truth telling to a Democratic Party that for much of this cycle, we were really trying to figure out how to win this thing, right? Uh, the last few weeks have been amazing, but the couple months before that were not so amazing. And they're, they're really- I don't, I don't recall be, any of that. <laughs> I, I know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's almost painful to, to try and remember. But, but you know, we, we, we built this project because we said someone just needs to go out there and do some victory-minded polling, right? There's all sorts of advocacy-minded polling. Oh, if you talk about our issue, it'll help you. Oh, if you tack to the left or the right on this, it'll help you, right? And all that's sponsored by advocacy organizations and special interest groups right. and corporate interest groups. And we, we were lucky enough to find a donor who has his own interests, right? And, but, but doesn't tell us what to do, frankly, um, and say, can, can you fund us to do just some victory minded polling. So we can go out and say as uncomfortable, as uncomfortable as it may make people. And it sometimes makes people uncomfortable when we go out and say, you know, so on Tuesday, we might go out and say, Hey, we need to get tougher on the border. Right. That makes some right. people in the democratic party uncomfortable on Wednesday. We might go out and say, Hey, we come with Harris needs to talk about prosecuting uh, corporate big ways. Right. That's very popular too. That makes other people in the democratic party uncomfortable, but it helps us with voters. And frankly, that's the task that, uh, that those of us who are in politics are supposed to be. Uh, so wait, before, before we get to Harris now, because you've opened up this can of worms, you brought this on us. OK, I didn't do that. I want to I want to go back to uh, the sort of post debate Biden period. Right. Tell us a little bit about that. And you're saying, well, you know, our job is to sort of tell data infused, uh, uncomfortable truths to Democrats. Um What were you seeing and how panicked were you at that point? <laughs> We were very panicked. We released, you know, we'd released the poll on the 26th, the day before the debate. And I had the misfortune of um, being asked uh, on television how I thought Joe Biden was going to do. And I said, he's going to do great. They made this mistake <laughs> with the State of the Union. They set the bar too low and he stepped over right, it. Right, right, right. And, and so, so we, we took a little bit of a pause after the debate because, frankly, we weren't sure. It didn't seem like polling numbers would help us figure out how to win this election, right? right. The, the question was, is, is Joe Biden going to going to remain or not remain our candidate? And I don't think he was looking to blueprint polling numbers to make that decision. Um, I, I have a big head, but not that big. Um, and, and so we pressed pause <laughs> for a little bit. We, we pressed pause for a little bit. And we, we said, let's see what the Democratic Party does, what these insiders do. Because again, if our mission is just help Democrats win elections, right. sometimes that means you need to sit back and let the party figure out what it's going to do. And then you re-engage and so as soon as Kamala Harris, actually before Kamala Harris, as soon as they rolled out J.D. Vance, um, we started polling again. We just released some of these numbers on Vance that show him in terrible shape. Uh, and then as soon as Harris became the nominee, we started polling immediately on Harris and found what you uh, mentioned at the top, which is a lot of voters have a lot to learn about her, right? right. They're excited. Right. They're excited to learn it, right? That's, that's a nice thing. It's not... Um, it's not what the Republicans are necessarily painting it as. They're now trying this, you know, chameleon, chameleon, chameleon right? Yeah. Um, tricky, the media, mediocre wordplay um, that they're doing. But, but it's not the kind of undefined where voters go, oh, I don't, she must stand for nothing. They're going, right. she must stand for something. I just don't know what it is yet, right? 
Yeah. Well, let's get let's get into the data a little bit because I think it's you know this helps people understand. There's so much to sort of. There's so many different things about her biography that we that she could focus on and in her political accomplishments. And so you guys tested, I would say, what uh, there's something like twenty or so, maybe more. Uh, biographical facts, political accomplishments, and issue positions. Among them, she was the Attorney General of California, a uh, tough on crime prosecutor, groundbreaking lawmaker, spent most of her childhood in a middle class neighborhood in California, uh, daughter of immigrants, uh, Baptist, is it? She's a Baptist, a member of that Third Baptist Church. Uh, and then political accomplishments. She prosecuted sex traffickers, secured settlements for students taken advantage for, of by predatory for profit education companies, sued BP in the Deepwater Horizon spill, uh, so on, shaped global climate policy. Uh, and then on issue positions, run on protecting Social Security and Medicare, uh, running on maintaining protections for those with pre existing health conditions, running on protecting a woman's right to choose. Running on standing up for Israel, running on protecting the rights of the LGBTQ community. I read most of them, not all of them. I just want to be clear, but that just gives the listener uh, and viewer a sense of the breadth of what you pulled. Now I turn it to you. What kind of surprised you uh, uh, about these results? Yeah, it, there there were a bunch of surprises, and the way we conducted this test um, was it was like a Mad Libs, right? We used a statistical yeah. tool called a conjoint analysis. So we showed people sentences that says Kamala Harris is blank, a biographical fact. She has now, done why, Hold on, blank. why do that? Mm-hmm. Why do it that way? Is there, is there a reason that you, you test it this way? Is it more honest, uh, the answers you get? We, we wanted to see if anything moved the needle, if anything stood out, right? We knew the campaign was going to go out uh, and the entire Democratic Party was going to go out and, and, and try and figure out how to introduce Kamala Harris to the country, right? right. Do you talk about her as, you know, a, a, a child of immigrants who has been, t- you know, with real climate policy accomplishments, who's going to stand up for marginalized communities, right? That's one way to talk about Kamala Harris. Another way to talk about Kamala Harris is a former prosecutor who put bad guys in jail and isn't going to let Donald Trump anywhere near your social security. That's a very right. different way to talk about Kamala Harris. So we, we did this, this conjoint analysis and each one of those slots, the biographical fact, the, um, the political accomplishment and the what she's running on, uh, there were probably 20 or 30 things we tested in each of those, right? Wow. So there were okay. thousands, thousands of permutations. Um, and we were looking for even small uh, benefits, right? What, what lists are numbers at all? What is the most important thing that people respond to when they learn about Kamala Harris? Right. Um, and the, one of the, the thing that really jumped out, um, and we had to think about why this was after we found it, was the emphasis on her prosecutorial background. Yes. Um, and, and particularly as California Attorney General. And the more, the more we've thought about this and, and dug into our own numbers to try and figure it out, because um, a lot of holsters like to pretend as soon as they have numbers, they know exactly what they mean. But it took us a while to really put our finger on this. Um, was that, you know, it was something that latched onto part of the biography that people already understood about Kamala Harris. Everyone knew she had some sort of prosecutorial background. Right. It was one of the only things people really knew about her. Um, uh, firmly and, and widely across the electorate. It was actually had a prosecutorial background. So it affirmed a pre, pre-existing conception. People go, ah, oh, that's right. I knew she, I knew she was something like that. That's right. California attorney general. And it allows her to, it allowed her to speak to things like going after cartels and MS-13 and, and human traffickers to mitigate some of the vulnerabilities that she and the Democratic Party have on immigration. It also allowed her to speak to the, to the economy. She has these great suits and prosecutions she undertook against BP and health insurance companies um, and uh, and uh, housing and finance companies, right? That were ripping right. people off. So let her speak to the economy as well. And finally, it got her beyond her time in Washington and her role as ah. vice president. So how because how does she communicate? I'm serious about immigration. I'm serious about the economy without mentioning the words, you know, Joe Biden's vice president. Right, right. Which suddenly ties her to all this. <laughs> well, just to put a fine point on this, because uh, the numbers are really uh, uh, amazing. Uh, when you tested political accomplishments, uh, the one that you tested that said she prosecuted sex traffickers and other men who abused women, putting them behind bars, had a plus eleven percent preference effect. Now, quickly define what a preference effect is. A preference effect means uh, it's the benefit that including that piece of information about Kamala Harris has above sort of a neutral effect, right? Gotcha. If you right. could so pick plus, anything yeah. to say. 
So this is plus 11. Now, I don't know if there was other ones that were close, but on this graph that I have here, the next closest one that you guys list was a plus 4% preference effect. And that was, again, prosecutorial. She secured a $1.1 billion settlement for students who were taken advantage of by a predatory for-profit education company. Okay. The reason I think these are crazy, number one is that um, the, the delta between those two, but secondarily is that, to your point, those two can be kind of hoodwinked or shoehorned into an attack on Donald Trump, right? And she's done it. Uh, she she said she prosecuted people who abused women, uh, and she secured settlements for people who operated predatory for-profit colleges. Both of them allow her to turn and attack Trump, her opponent. It's very rare that you get these political accomplishments that dovetail so cleanly with your immediate partisan interests. Mm-hmm. And, and it's also valuable because, you know, there's been some uh, – Democrats have gotten excited about this prosecutor versus the felon framing. Yeah. But, but that's less interesting uh, to most voters than a prosecutor versus the bad guys framing. Yeah. Right? Donald Trump, of course, uh, stirs the, the passions of people in the Democratic base. But mm-hmm. there are about 500,000 voters who are going to decide this election in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Nevada, Georgia, and, and, uh, and Arizona, right? Most of them, the reason they're on the fence is because they don't despise Donald Trump. Right. If they despise Donald Trump, they'd already be voting for us. So, so the prosecutor versus the felon framing is not necessarily the way to those people's hearts. They have concerns like they think they're getting ripped off by big companies exploiting uh, inflation and high price levels. They have concerns about the border and immigration. Uh, they have concerns about crime. Right. right. Whether, any, whether these concerns are legitimate, illegitimate, well-founded, not well-founded, uh, you know, not my place to say it. what moves sure. voters moves voters. Well, um, let's talk about what doesn't move voters, uh, mm-hmm. because there are some things that tested poorly, right? Like they had negative mm-hmm. preference effects. Uh, tell us about what stood out in that respect. Well, the, the things that had negative preference effects were sort of soft facts from her bio, you know, like she's a Baptist or she, she's a child of immigrants. Which no, it's not because these are negative things. People don't have negative perceptions of these right. things. They're just not interested in hearing about it right now. People are, have to learn a lot about Kamala Harris very quickly. Sure, but I right? was still surprised that the negative nine percent preference effect of noting that she's a Baptist. I mean, like, I guess people just don't want a Baptist. I don't know. Negative nine seems a little profound. It, it doesn't. It doesn't necessarily mean it, it, it hurts you. There's no reason sure. for her not to talk about it. It just means they're that any other option that you could tell people about yourself, any other piece of information <laughs> is, is going to help move their vote more. It's not that it's better. It helps yeah. move their vote more, right? Got you. So yeah. they're much more interested in hearing, hey, by the way, I was an attorney general. Here's my experience. I, I know you know my name, but you might not know much about me. Right, I did right, this, right. this, this, and this. Rather than saying, hey, by the way, you know, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm a Baptist and I grew up in an immigrant household. People go, great. Uh, we're talking about making you the president, right? Yeah. All right, let's move over to the to the issue position though, because that's the ones; those are the ones that stood out to me. There are certain issues that clearly uh, are not beneficial to her campaign if she emphasizes. Uh, yes. Um, well, I thought you know it, the the LGBTQ rights is interesting. Yeah. Again, I think it, I, I I I don't. I mean, it's obviously a more divisive issue than many other things. Like I'm going to take on the big corporations, sure. or I'm going to do something about immigration. So it, it is just more divisive. The numbers tend to be. Uh, uh, you know, when you pull the issue standalone. But again, it's not something people feel they need to know about her. She's right. Voters know she's a liberal. They know she's, she is a, has a background in San Francisco and California. So it's not a new piece of information that she's pro LGBTQ yeah. to most people. They want new information that helps them right. make their decision about who they're going to vote for for president. So of course the democratic vice president who is a career politician from California supports LGBTQ rights. Everyone right. assumes that. It's sort of an opportunity cost to emphasize that, right? It's like you could be emphasizing other things. People already know that you emphasize LGBTQ rights and that you will protect it. The other one, and so that one had a negative 13% preference effect. The other one uh, that really stood out was she is running on standing up for Israel, which had a negative 10% preference effect. Is it fair to assume that a lot of that is anger among fellow Democrats, progressives over that, or is there something more to it? I think it's... uh you know, Kamala Harris is sort of a chance is like an escape hatch from our current, the current state of our politics. Right. And I think the more people hear her talk about the issues that are already viewed as sort of a, a, a drag, a burden on our politics, like, like, the, you know, I, and I know that's a, a sort of, 
a trite way to talk about the conflict, but I think a lot of people are just like, oh, she's just going to talk about the, the stuff we're already hearing about, right? Yeah. That's yeah. the last thing. And, um, and when we did, we pulled in this, in this research as well, um, we pulled a whole bunch of things that have happened, policy initiatives, world events that have happened on, during the Biden administration, and said, what do you think Joe Biden is mostly responsible for? What do you think Kamala Harris is mostly responsible for? And what do you think is mostly even? The foreign policy, whether it's Israel, whether it's Ukraine, whether it's the withdrawal from Afghanistan, is almost entirely considered the responsibility of Joe Biden. So hearing Kamala Harris, and, and, and almost no one considers Kamala Harris involved in what about or inflation? blame to her. Is the same thing happening with inflation where they put it on Biden, not her? It is. It's, it's, it's a little lower than, uh, than, than foreign policy because Biden has owned these foreign policy decisions so, so wholly. Yeah. Um, but, but it is. Uh, it's, it's right below uh, uh, foreign policy. Um, and, and, you know, that test suggests the degree to which voters are, are giving Kamala Harris a pass on inflation mm-hmm. in the economy. But there are other tests we've done um, on who voters trust more on various uh, inflationary issues like the price of groceries, the price of gas, uh, the price of housing and rent. And when we tested those when Biden was the nominee, he had enormous deficits to Donald Trump on all of those figures. When we test them with Kamala Harris, she has erased most of those deficits. Wild. Voters are giving her the benefit of the doubt, but very wild. Um, yeah. and, uh, and the only place where Donald Trump still really has an advantage is on gas prices and interest rates. And both of those are becoming a little less salient because we're likely to see a rate cut on interest yeah. rates. Uh, and gas prices have moved into a sort of secondary position in the inflation discourse behind grocery and food prices. Okay, well, look, I want to wrap this up by pointing to a tweet um, that Kamala Harris issued today at 10.49 a.m., clearly, uh, you know, incorporating the reams of blueprint data before her social media team signed off on it. It reads, quote, I served as a U.S. senator, an attorney general, and a district attorney, and a courtroom prosecutor. In those roles, I took on predators who abused women, fraudsters who ripped off consumers, and scammers who broke the rules. I know Donald Trump's type. I mean, that's like, <laughs> yeah, she's hitting all your notes, man. Do you feel? I, did you write that? I don't know. Did you write no, that? no, okay. no. But fortunately, <laughs> they don't let us write write tweets. Um, no, I mean, I listen. I, I it's, it, it, I'd love to be able to say, oh, it's all you know. Blueprint has, has helped make this happen. Just say it. Literal. But they, have, <laughs> but I mean, they have legions of internal bolsters. Yeah, um, who I'm sure are finding the same thing. And one of the reasons why, um, why we do what we do uh, is not because we think the the pollsters working on the campaign or within the Democratic Party. Uh, are going to find anything different than we are, but because we think it's important to talk publicly and say, particularly for people in democratic politics who, who care about the future of the democratic right. party, who want to be Donald Trump, say, listen, sometimes there are going to be some uncomfortable things that you might, that might not reflect your personal politics, but it, you have to think long and hard about where your line is um, that you're willing to see Kamala Harris cross in order to beat Donald Trump, right? If you were willing to see her talk a little tougher on the border and that's okay with you, yep, that's going to help us beat Donald Trump. If you're okay right. seeing her talk tough on corporate America, that's going to help us beat Donald Trump, right? If you're seeing her, if you are okay seeing her lift the salience of, of reproductive access and, and abortion rights in this country, which had fallen a little bit off the, into the background in this election before she was the nominee, um, uh, that's going to help us beat Donald Trump, it would appear. Um, and, so, and so that's one of the reasons why we do this publicly. Um, but it is good to see uh, some of what we find clearly reflected in the, in the campaign. At least the, you know your data is pretty solid. Uh, Evan Roth Smith, uh, hey, thank you so much for unpacking this. I, I do appreciate it. Um, and let's get you back on uh, the next time we have some good data to talk about, okay? All right. If we ever have any good data, I'll let you know. <laughs> All right. Thank you, man. Take care. And everyone, please, as always, uh, subscribe to the Bulwark Q2 page. Uh, all of our work, these interviews, the reporting, really it benefits from the support of viewers and listeners like you. Hey guys, it's Sam Stein, Managing Editor at The Bulwark. I want to just take a moment to talk to you about what we have planned for the upcoming Democratic Convention. We're going to have a lot of original reporting from people on the ground in Chicago. We're also going to be having really interesting insights and analysis from some of our staff back here in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere. A lot of what we're doing is going to be going up on our YouTube page. We're producing amazing video content there. And I want you to think about subscribing to that page 
All this stuff that we are doing depends on people like you subscribing, supporting our mission, helping our reporters and journalists out as they cover events like the Democratic Convention in Chicago. So please take your time, go to our YouTube page, check out what we've done there and subscribe. And more than that, tell your friends to subscribe too. We need the support of people like you.